Hi, it's Kate, and this is the second video for week 7 of Math 23. Now for some properties of continuous functions that you may find useful as you're doing your work. First, say we have a function f that we've already proven is continuous, or we know that it's continuous. Note that if f is continuous at a given point x0, then the absolute value of the function f is also going to be continuous at that point. If f is continuous at x0, then any scalar multiple of that function is also continuous at x0. If we have two functions, f and g, that are both continuous at x0, then the sum of the functions is continuous at x0 as well. The product of the functions is continuous at x0. And the quotient of the functions is also continuous at x0 as long as g down here does not equal 0 as its function value at x0. Also, if f is continuous at x0 and g is continuous at f of x0, then the composite function g composed of f, or g of f of x, is continuous at x0. What's interesting is once that you know the identity function and elementary functions like the nth root of a particular variable, sine, cosine, exponentials, logarithms, etc. are all continuous, you can state this casual rule, which is very uh, helpful, which is that if you can write a formula for a function that does not involve division by zero, that function is continuous everywhere. Some theorems about continuous functions which are very useful. Note that if we have a continuous function on a closed interval, very important, which is an example of a compact set, it's easy to prove by using the bolzano weierstrass theorem that one, that function is a bounded function, which means that there exists some real number such that the absolute value of the function values is less than that real number. And we can also prove that the function achieves its maximum and minimum values on the particular closed interval. Let's take a look at more interesting properties of continuous functions. One theorem that you've definitely heard of before but probably have never been able to prove is the intermediate value theorem. I told you guys the most quote unquote obvious proofs are frequently the most difficult but this is a great example of where the idea of epsilon delta continuity comes in handy and Ross himself actually does the sequence definition of continuity, either one can be used to prove the intermediate value theorem uh, in very similar ways. But what is the intermediate value theorem? A good brush up is very necessary. Uh, F is continuous on an interval, not necessarily closed. The intermediate value theorem says that if A is less than B and Y lies between the function values F of A and F of B, then there exists at least one x in this interval from a to b for which the function value at x is equal to y. Another way that people frequently uh, talk about this is saying that, okay, well, if you know on one end of an interval the function value is less than zero and on the other end of the interval the function value is greater than zero, then there has to be at least one place on the interval where the function value is equal to zero. Same idea. There are some other corollaries that are really useful to think about. One is that the image of an interval i is either a single point or an interval itself called j. So i is the interval in the domain, j is the interval in the image. If f is a strictly increasing function on i, remember, still an interval in the domain. If f is a strictly increasing function on this interval in the domain, then there's a continuous, strictly increasing inverse function, f inverse, which maps from this interval in the image, remember that guy j up there, to the interval in the domain. And similarly, if f is a strictly decreasing function on the interval in the domain, then there's a continuous, strictly decreasing inverse function, f inverse, which maps from the interval in the image back to the interval in the domain. And last but not least, if f is one-to-one -one on the interval in the domain, it is either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. Think about what that means for a function to be one-to-one. -one. And why, if it is in fact one-to-one, -one, 
it must be either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing over that particular interval. What would happen if it was both increasing and decreasing at different parts in the interval? Just some things to think about as you're reviewing this topic.